Hello, and welcome to Settle the Stars, episode 21, The Moon, Humanity's First Small Step. Hey folks, this is Alexander Wynn. This week, we'll be continuing our exploration closer to home by taking a look at one of the most well-known objects in the night sky, the moon. In spite of its familiarity across every single culture on the planet, we're finding out there's a lot about the moon that is highly unusual. And for all its quirks, the moon still plays a major active part in our daily lives, whether we even notice them or not. In today's episode, we'll examine some of these quirks and the scientific advances that have brought them into focus, as well as the important opportunities that future space explorers and real estate brokers might find interesting. Today's journey is a refreshingly short one, a mere 238,855 miles from Earth. In terms of cosmic distance, that's right on our doorstep, or closer even, right at the tip of our nose. And our moon is exceptionally large relative to the Earth as well, with a diameter a little over 2,000 miles across. That's the largest size of a moon relative to its parent of any in the solar system, and the fifth largest moon in the solar system at all. And with those dimensions, the moon dominates our night sky. The moon completes one orbit around the Earth every 29.53 days, which is the length of a lunar month. And contrary to the popular belief that the moon doesn't rotate, it in fact completes one rotation in almost exactly the same time as its orbit, meaning that at all times, only one side of the moon ever faces the Earth. That's where we get the phrase, dark side of the moon which doesn't mean that it never gets sunlight, but rather that we can never see it from Earth. The slow passage of the moon around the Earth is also what causes the familiar phases we see each night as the lunar month progresses, but the effects are much more significant than just a slideshow of phases. The gravity of the moon exerts an impressive force on the Earth, even with only 1.2% its mass. We notice this most obviously in the tides which ebb and flow as the moon pulls the Earth's water into two bulges, one directly under the moon and the other on the opposite side of the Earth. The result is a cycle of two high tides that repeat about every 24 hours as the Earth rotates. By chance, the moon takes up about the same amount of space in the sky as the sun, as observed from Earth, which is what makes the occasional solar eclipse such a spectacle. A solar eclipse occurs as the moon passes between the Earth and the Sun, aligning perfectly in the sky for an observer directly below. The result is a brilliant glimpse for just a few moments of the outer corona of the Sun, which is usually impossible to discern when the sunlight is unimpeded. On average, there's a solar eclipse somewhere on the planet every 18 months or so, but the same location on the planet will observe a total eclipse every 360 to 410 years. As far as scientists can tell, this alignment of the size of the moon and sun relative to their distances from Earth creating similar apparent sizes in the sky is a total coincidence. On the other side of the dance, the Earth casts a shadow over the moon occasionally in a lunar eclipse. These occur more frequently than solar eclipses, in part because Earth's shadow is much larger. Anywhere from two to five lunar eclipses occur every year each depicting a gradual shading of the moon as the Earth's shadow passes over it, sometimes producing a deep red or orange color known as the blood moon. The color is due to the light refracting through the Earth's atmosphere onto the surface of the moon as the direct light is blotted out. This refracted light is essentially light from the entire planet's sunsets, putting on a brilliant show across the face of the moon. In addition to these demonstrations, the moon's gravity claws at the Earth as it rotates below, causing the length of the day on Earth to elongate by about 17 microseconds with every turn. This is a normal process for a planet and moon to undergo if they're not mutually tidally locked, that is, continuing this trend until each is showing only one face to the other as they circle. But in our particular case, it's very, very slow the Earth and the Moon will both be long gone before the conclusion is reached. These same tidal forces are actually transferring more momentum to the Moon, which in turn gradually moves into a higher orbit. This means the distance between the Moon and the Earth is increasing over time as well, but only by about 38 millimeters per year, or about 3 meters in a human lifetime. 
Again, at this rate, it will never escape Earth's orbit before both are swallowed by the eventual destruction of the sun. Many of these detailed measurements are possible because of the work of the visiting astronauts of the Apollo missions. But the truth is we've been studying the moon closely since long before that. Perhaps the first recorded depiction of the moon is a rock carving discovered in Noth, Ireland, dating back over 5,000 years. But rigorous scientific observations can be traced to the 5th century BC by, as always, the Babylonians. Babylonian astronomers recorded an 18-year cycle of eclipses, known as a Saros, which describes a series of repeated eclipse events that can be used to anticipate future phenomena. One feature of the moon that became obvious to the keen observer was its spherical shape, revealed by watching shadows pass across its surface. Observations from the 4th century BC across the world from Greece to China depict the body's spherical shape, even if they did not quite agree on the composition or which deity it represented. Aristotle depicted the moon as the boundary between the inner spheres of the elements and the outer permanent sphere of ether, an influential view that persisted for centuries. That didn't stop Ptolemy from estimating the size and distance in the second century AD, however, to an astounding degree of accuracy. Galileo's telescopes dispersed many misconceptions about the moon in 1609, including the idea that the moon's surface was perfectly smooth. He revealed that the terrain was in fact quite rough on the surface, covered in mountains and craters easily discernible between the light and shadow. These craters were initially believed to be volcanic in origin, but Richard Proctor cleared that up in the 1870s with later confirmation in the 1920s and 40s, giving rise to the discipline of lunar stratigraphy, or the study of geological layers in an effort to piece together the history and natural forces that shape a place over time. By the 1950s, this discipline had grown into a sizable portion of the wider field of astrogeology, driven by important comparative studies and geological maps made by telescopic observations. Though not the first, the moon would become the subject of possibly the most important and influential international scientific rivalry in history, the space race. From the 1950s to the 1970s, the Cold War was in full swing, pitting the world's two greatest superpowers, the United States and the Soviet Union, into a titanic struggle to be the first to visit. Ever eager for an opportunity to one-up each other without bombing each other back to the Stone Age, the powers set their sights skyward. The moon represented the final frontier of human exploration and a prize of the incalculable resources, prestige, and scientific superiority for whichever nation won. The Soviet Union took an early lead in the race, accomplishing manned orbits, interplanetary probes, and the first unmanned probe directly to the moon. The lunar missions were named Program Luna, with 24 missions officially designated as part of the Luna series, although more were launched. Of these, 15 were successful and they included the first successful landing by Luna 9 in 1966. Eventually, lunar samples were even returned to Earth by Luna 16, 20, and 24 between 1970 and 1976. In parallel, the USA conducted its own missions at breakneck speed, beginning with Project Horizon, which was a study to test the feasibility of building a military base on the moon. The proposed base could be useful for everything from scientific study to nuclear bombardment of terrestrial targets. In those days, there weren't many locations that weren't considered for their ability to launch warheads. The USA's Civilian National Aeronautics and Space Administration, or NASA, took the lead for the country's own space missions in direct competition with the Soviet efforts. An unmanned landing was accomplished by the Surveyor Program four months after the successful Luna 9 landing, but NASA would cross the finish line for manned missions first with the Apollo program. Project Apollo was a series of 17 missions led by NASA with the ultimate goal of manned spaceflight to the moon. Early missions were a gradual progression toward that goal, with the first crewed flight by Apollo 7 and Apollo 10 achieving the first manned orbit of the moon in May of 1969. The famous first moonwalk was achieved by the crew of Apollo 11 in July 1969 and Neil Armstrong's One Small Step speech still echoes in the minds of people around the world over 50 years later. The Apollo missions made use of the Saturn line of rockets to reach orbit, the Saturn V becoming the workhorse for most of the Apollo missions. This iconic single white and black rocket towered 363 feet and weighed over 6 million pounds, 
designed by the former Nazi scientist Werner von Braun. Von Braun became a prominent scientist in America after he was brought here as part of a secret program called Operation Paperclip at the conclusion of the Second World War. Under this directive, 1,600 prominent scientists and engineers from all levels of the Nazi regime were brought to the U.S. and provided employment in one of the most ambitious brain drains of the modern era. But whatever your feelings about the operation that brought him here, Werner von Braun's expertise and oversight of the Apollo program eventually delivered the NASA astronauts to the surface of the moon. The Saturn V rocket conveyed the crews to space over a course of three stages. The first utilized RP-1, or a refined petroleum fuel, to generate 7,600,000 pounds of thrust from five separate engines. This stage would get the ship to an altitude of 42 miles high and traveling at a speed of over 7,500 feet per second before separating from the main body and falling to Earth by parachute. The second stage used liquid hydrogen as fuel, also powering five separate engines. This stage would accelerate the craft through the upper atmosphere with about 1.1 million pounds of force, significantly less than the first stage, but in a vacuum it's much easier to pick up speed. After a couple of orbits around the Earth to build momentum, the third stage sent the craft on its way toward the moon. While en route, the crew reconfigured the remaining modules for landing before entering orbit around the moon. The trip to the moon and back would be spent in the command module, with only about as much room to stretch as you'd get in a coach seat on an airline. That isn't much space for a trip of about three days each way. Not a lot of effort was spent on astronaut comfort. The crew then left the final service module in orbit before descending to the surface of the moon in the landing module. After a successful landing, the Apollo astronauts had the chance to get out and stretch their legs a bit. Not that their legs actually needed stretching. The trip through space had already accomplished that, an astronaut's body can be lengthened by as much as 3% without gravity. But aside from exercise and a bit of fun, Alan Shepard even packed a golf club, the important scientific work had to be done. The astronauts collected valuable samples during their trip, gradually increasing the payload each mission with a total haul of almost a thousand pounds of rock and dust. But they left a lot as well. Along with the probes and crashed service modules, each Apollo landing left behind its insect-looking descent stage, and a few lunar roving vehicles are still there as well. There are also some pieces of scientific equipment, including a seismometer for measuring geological activity, which led to the discovery of lunar earthquakes, as well as magnetometers, heat flow sensors, and special passive arrays used for deflecting laser beams that we still use today to precisely measure the distance to the moon. The Apollo missions pushed the envelope in almost every field of science and technology and led to some breakthroughs that we still employ today. But with the space race won and the eventual collapse of the Soviet Union, due in part to the expensive competition, the United States turned its attention away from the moon and no astronauts have visited since. However, that hasn't halted study completely. Since the 70s, other agencies have visited the moon for science with unmanned systems including the European orbiter SMART-1, which completed the first full map of the moon in 2009. The Chinese joined in with the Chang'e spacecraft and the lunar lander Yutu in 2013, which successfully returned a fresh sample of moon rocks. The Japanese orbiter Kayuga collected valuable geophysics data in 2009, and India's first lunar foray, Chandrayaan-1, created a detailed chemical and mineralogical map of the entire surface. With this, they finally confirmed the presence of water molecules in the lunar soil, a long-standing question among scientists. More recently, NASA has launched two orbiters in 2012 called GRAIL, which gather extensive magnetic readings to determine the internal structure of the moon, and the LADI probe, which studies the exosphere after the Apollo astronauts observed mysterious glows and rays high above the surface as they orbited. The information gathered by this large and still growing group of scientific missions show us a much more rich and detailed view of the moon than we had even two decades ago. The detailed geological maps show a wide range of terrain, including ancient volcanoes and pools of solidified lava. These features are long dormant, it's believed there would have been no volcanic activity on the moon for at least a few million years. The surface is also covered by great basins, like the massive South Pole Aitken Basin on the far side of the moon, which sprawls almost 1,400 miles across. We've learned that this basin is actually the site of a massive crater, 
the second largest confirmed impact crater in the solar system after the Utopia crater on Mars. Also observed on the surface are a unique phenomenon called lunar swirls. These are bright features on the surface that often lie in a sinuous shape. Orbiters have revealed that these features lie in areas with enhanced magnetic fields, sometimes located on the opposite side of the moon from major impact sites. It's believed that these areas are somehow partially shielded from the solar wind, perhaps by a localized magnetic field, which causes the surface material to appear younger and brighter than the surrounding area. As with almost all objects they study, astrogeologists were curious to discover whether water existed on the moon for decades. It is known that without an atmosphere or a strong magnetic field, the solar radiation will quickly break up water into hydrogen and oxygen and then blow it off into space. The presence of water ice has finally been confirmed, both by spectrographic analysis of samples from the moon as well as extensive reflection imaging. It exists mostly at the poles, shaded from the destructive sunlight in craters and mountainsides that never get direct exposure. It was also discovered that while almost non-existent, a transient trace of an atmosphere does actually exist on the moon. Weighing less than 10 tons in total, next to Earth's 5.5 quadrillion tons of air for comparison. The tenuous atmosphere is generated from outgassing as the moon is bombarded by the solar wind. Sodium, potassium, helium, and neon have all been detected, as well as byproducts from the radioactive decay of argon, radon, and polonium. Still mysterious is the absence of oxygen, nitrogen, carbon, and hydrogen, all of which are known to be present in the crust material. The same crust material collected from the Apollo missions revealed that about three or four billion years ago, the moon actually had a thick atmosphere, about twice as thick as the one currently on Mars. It would have been fed by extensive volcanic activity and probably lasted for up to 70 million years before being stripped away by the solar wind. The space around the moon is also filled with dust, almost 300 pounds of it floating around at any one time. This dust is collected from comet particles that the moon passes through or is ejected from impacts. In contrast with the dormant exterior, the interior of the moon is still relatively dynamic. The solid iron core is about 150 miles wide, surrounded by an outer core of liquid iron about 190 miles deep. A partially molten boundary separates the core from the crust, which is about 30 miles thick. The moon's high iron content makes it extremely dense, the second densest satellite in the solar system after Io. Despite the internal liquid iron, the moon does not currently have an active dynamo to generate a magnetic field. That stopped functioning about one billion years ago as the core crystallized. A weak field does persist, however, approximately 100 thousandth the strength of Earth's. Scientists believe the field originates from transient fields generated by large impacts. And speaking of large impacts, we can't fail to mention the most important one of all, the hypothesized collision that is thought to have created the moon in the first place. In this event, an object roughly the size of Mars that scientists have named Thea would have collided with the newly formed Earth, melting the crust of the planet and ejecting massive amounts of material into orbit. These materials would have coalesced over time to form the moon, which in the early days would have been covered by its own ocean of magma up to a thousand miles deep. A study completed in 2001 supports this theory, as scientists found that the isotopic signatures within moon rocks are the same as those from Earth, which would almost be impossible if the two bodies were originally formed separately. As the Apollo astronauts could tell you, there isn't much about the moon currently that would make life easy for any visitors, the intense radiation and temperature variations need to be accounted for, and the dust can disrupt sensitive equipment. Past astronauts even described a particular smell in the cabin after returning from a moonwalk due to the collected dust, which they named the Apollo Aroma. Not that any of this is likely to dissuade future explorers. In 2020, NASA announced an upcoming program to return to the moon, named Artemis. This mission will include a long-term base camp, proposed to be located near the South Pole to house astronauts for up to a week at a time. Initial studies conducted here will help in developing new technologies for generating water, power, and large-scale construction in the lunar environment. Expeditions could branch out from the base camp, utilizing an impressive mobile habitable platform that could house scientists for a month or more as they explore. 
Evoking a space race deja vu, China and Russia have proposed their own joint venture to build a base on the moon within a similar time frame of about 10 years. Even these ambitious goals are scoped out with an eye toward the next horizon. A major motivator of these efforts is the aim of eventual human travel to Mars, which could benefit from a pit stop on the moon for fuel and supplies before making the long journey. Long-term permanent settlements are not out of the question either. The Chinese Chang'e 1 rover managed to successfully sprout at least one seed in its onboard lab, confirming the possibility of hydroponic or artificial environment agriculture to help support a population of visitors. And the potential for commercial tourism is a big draw too. Many of the wealthiest on Earth would gladly pay top dollar for a chance to bounce around a lunar golf course or catch the Earth rise over their morning moon-farmed coffee. The prospect of mining on the moon is a serious consideration as well. One technology currently being developed seems appropriately science fiction-y, ablative arc mining, or in more impressive terms, mining by lightning. In this technique, strong electrical currents are applied to the surface by electrodes, which sublimate ice into vapor and pull metals out of the crust. Electric fields then guide the particles into capture chambers for collection and processing. Such a method could extract large amounts of water, which would otherwise be too scarce to bother with. And aside from its essential function for supporting life, water, or rather the hydrogen within water, is an important component of rocket fuel. Production of fuel in space would not only be a boon of convenience for travel to and from the moon, but would cement the lunar base's important status as an interplanetary gas station on the way out to other planets. As of this moment, the major spacefaring nations have reached a consensus about the legal status of the moon. Despite American flags and Soviet pendants scattered across the surface, the nations all agree that the moon, or anything out in space, cannot be claimed by any one nation, and that the moon cannot be used for military operations or installations. Only time will tell whether that consensus will last, but for now, the future of the moon is brightened by the promise of continued scientific study and important technological development on our path to the stars. I hope you enjoyed our visit to the moon this week. We'll complete our tour of the solar system next week by returning back to the main event, the head honcho, the single most unique body in the entire known universe, Earth. In the meantime, be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. Settle the Stars is available on pretty much every podcasting platform, and we're also mirroring our episodes on YouTube at youtube.com slash edgeworksentertainment. And be sure to ring that bell so you know when there's a new episode. We also have a Patreon page at patreon.com slash edgeworksentertainment, where you can get early episodes and tons of other great rewards. The support of listeners like you is what makes this show possible, and I am so grateful to the people who have already joined. Thank you all for listening, and as always, happy terrible. Settle the Stars is a proud member of the Edgeworks Nebula, a collection of intriguing and informative podcasts from Edgeworks Entertainment. Edgeworks Nebula.